On Thursday, June 24th, 2021, a 12 story beachfront condo complex in Florida unexpectedly collapsed. This story shook the nation as the president declared an emergency in Florida. FEMA sent help to those impacted by this event and families of the residents visited dealing with a torturous window of uncertainty. This story marks one of the most devastating structural engineering failures of all time and it has raised a ton of questions about how these high rise buildings are constructed. In today's video, we are going to talk about the history history of the Champlain Towers, the timeline of events from collapse to demolition, the cause of this tragedy, and then what is next as it relates to this event. And just a quick introduction in case you haven't seen any of my other videos before. My name is Scott. I'm a real estate developer myself out of Arizona. So here on my channel, we talk all things real estate. This story is admittedly much more somber than all of the other topics that I cover here on my channel. But I think that this is an important one that we talk about while being sensitive to all of the lives lost. And I hope that I convey that in this video. This condo complex known as the Champlain Towers was built in 1981 at 8777 Collins Avenue on the southeastern tip of Florida. The condos were located located in a small one square mile town called Surfside, which is a beachfront town on the northernmost stretch of Miami Beach. Looking back to 1970, there was a lot of pressure from developers at the time to make this region of Miami more luxury and a more tourist driven market. The residents of Surfside at that time though were more of an older retired generation and they were not interested in taking the city in that direction. On top of the fact that the developers didn't have the local support to build, there was also what they call a moratorium on new buildings building construction in Surfside in the 1970s, which basically meant that no new buildings were allowed to be constructed in the area because the city was worried that the existing sewer system would not be able to accommodate all of these new developments and new residents. By 1979 though, one of the developers agreed to chip in $200,000 towards the sewer repairs, and in turn, he was given the green light to move forward with his project, which happened to be the Champlain Towers. This developer was actually the first to be given approval to build anything following that moratorium on new construction. When you're building a big commercial condo complex like this one, there's a few key members of the team, which are the developer, the architect, several engineers, and a general contractor. The developer's responsibility is usually to find land, figure out the best use for that land, then put together a team and go through the construction process and build out your project. And then last on a project like this one, they either sell or lease the units. The development team on this project was called Champlain Tower South Associates, which was led by a guy named Nathan Reber. The architect was William W. Freeman and Associates. The engineering was led by Breederman Gerardo and Associates. And Natel Construction Inc. acted as the general contractor on all three of the Champlain buildings. It would be incredibly insightful to be able to talk to some of the people behind these firms to talk about exactly how this building was constructed and how exactly it fell, but unfortunately, the principals of all of these companies have since passed away. It took three years to finish construction on the Champlain Towers south and north, with the south tower that we're talking about today containing 136 units. Those 136 units were originally zoned as condos for people to buy and live in, and they are still zoned for that purpose when the building collapsed. These were pretty luxurious residences with walk-in closets, oceanfront balconies, a gym, a heated pool, and a valet. Because of all of those amenities, the Champlain Towers were not an affordable place to live in by any means, with the most recent sale that I could find on Zillow being a ninth floor 1,700 square foot unit, which sold for $710,000. And you can see here, just a few weeks prior to that, there was actually a penthouse unit that sold for nearly $3 million. It's really crazy and sad to see just all of the sales activity leading up to the collapse because it really goes to show that the residents had no idea that this was coming. When it comes to the series of events following the collapse of the Champlain Towers, I want to be extremely sensitive here because the reality is the events that followed the collapse are all very unfortunate and very tragic. The Champlain South Tower partially collapsed in the middle of the night on Thursday, June 24th at 1.30 a.m. Initial reports announced that there were about 100 people who were unaccounted for, and there were another 35 people who needed to be rescued from the part of the building that was still standing. The very next day, President Biden declared an emergency in Florida. By Saturday the 26th, victims of the collapse were already starting to be identified, and a report was released by an engineering firm from 2018 showing that there were structural issues with the Champlain Towers. As the rescue and recovery efforts continued, 
more statements were released showing that this building was known to be in trouble and the owners were just days away from a deadline where they were required to complete over $10 million worth of repairs to the tower. By Wednesday, June 30th, the rescue efforts intensified in fear of an incoming tropical storm. On Friday, July 2nd, the mayor of Miami-Dade County signed an emergency order to demolish the portion of the tower that was still standing with the governor to pay for the demolition. Sunday, July 4th, the remaining portion of the Champlain towers that was still standing was demolished. For the next 10 days, officials and rescuers continued their efforts, identifying a total of 98 victims from this horrific event. Before we get into the possible causes of the building collapse, I'd like to first just pause this video for a quick moment of silence for those 98 people and their families. The cause of exactly how the Champlain Towers collapsed hasn't been officially determined yet, but enough information has been released to give us a pretty good idea. The first recent report of concern that I could find on this building was in 2019, when a resident in the building filed a lawsuit because she said that water was leaking through the concrete walls and down onto her terrace. Just a few years after that, in 2018, an engineering consultant conducted a study and identified signs of major structural damage. I was able to dig up the actual inspection report, which was conducted by a company called Morabito Consultants consultants, and it is both frightening and telling. The report starts by saying that this 12-story condo complex was ordered to be inspected to understand the structural issues that require repair or remediation. It is a really long report, and I'm not going to bore you guys with all of the details, but here I'll give you a quick summary. The first major point of concern is on page 7, where the engineer calls out issues around the pool deck and entrance drive, where he states that the waterproofing is beyond its useful life and therefore must all be completely removed and repaired. Place. He then goes on to say that the failed waterproofing is causing major structural damage. And if that wasn't room for enough concern, the engineer also details under section J that there are signs of distress and fatigue in the parking structure as well. He says that abundant cracking and spalling of varying degrees were observed in the concrete columns, beams, and walls. And he also points out that there is deteriorating rebar. Then he includes some photos of these concerns in his report. The last section of the report calls out some final observations related to the repairs that had happened in the garage in the past. The engineer reports here that many of the previous garage repairs were failing, resulting in additional concrete cracking, and that new cracks were radiating from the originally repaired cracks. They state that the previously completed repairs were ineffective in fixing a problem that was identified years ago. I cannot believe that this professional identified these issues three years prior to the collapse, and over that course of time, nothing was done to remedy the problem. The engineer in the report does specifically call out that these repairs that he's suggesting are going to be incredibly invasive and expensive, as much as $15 million, but there is absolutely no excuse for putting the residents of the tower's lives at risk by putting these repairs off until it was too late. There isn't a final verdict on what ultimately caused the collapse here, but the investigators are looking at the original plans, weak beams, the pool deck, and maybe even the soil in the surrounding area settling all as possible culprits. The next steps in this story are slowly unfolding and there are a few things at play. First is the question as to what will happen at the site of the fallen building and there are divided opinions here for sure. The families of those that lost their lives in this tragedy naturally would like to see the site become a memorial of some kind to honor and respect those that once lived there. The judge in the case however stated in court last week that there is an unnamed buyer who has offered 120 $20 million for the land, which of course leaves a lot of people fearful that it will be soon developed into more condos or a hotel or something like that. Simply put though, there is just no easy way to honor those that lost their lives and bring in enough money to compensate the former condo owners. See, while there were a lot of people who lost their lives in this event, there were also a lot of survivors who lost almost everything who could desperately use a payout from a sale. This is a very troubling predicament and all we can hope for is that a plan is agreed upon that will work for everybody and maybe that is a combination of developing some of the site plus preserving some of the site for a memorial. I'm gonna be honest guys this was a really hard video for me to make. I saw an update on the story this 
this past week, so I committed to go into research mode and learning more about the building and the history and what's next, but I was quickly hit with the gravity of just truly how tragic this story is. All I ask of you guys, if you made it to this point in the video, if you could check out the links down in the description below for different ways to donate to those impacted by this event in Surfside, Florida. I found all of those links on their local news site, and it looks like they're all great organizations who are making a difference here. So that's all I've got for you guys this time. Please consider just taking a few minutes out of your day to pay it forward through one of those links below. As always, thank you guys for watching. Until next time.